Today we'll begin the first of five talks on the oceans. The oceans have become of great interest to us in recent years because of the exploitation of its mineral resources, of its oil exploration, and because of fisheries. Historically, the oceans have always been of interest to mankind. In the early times, the major interest was in in the tides in the Mediterranean because of the transportation system there. Now, we'll begin by looking at the Mediterranean and the transportation system. And in this first lecture, we will deal with the historical aspects of the oceans. In the second lecture, we will go on to describe the major ocean currents in the third lecture, we will look at some of the details of the ocean currents, and we'll also look at some of the coastal processes. In the fourth lecture, we will deal with the tides and the formation of waves, and in the fifth lecture, we will deal with the interactions of the atmosphere with the ocean, which are very important. Now, to begin with, let us first of all look at these oceans that we are talking about, and we will do that by looking at a globe. The first major ocean is the Atlantic Ocean, and as you can see, the Atlantic Ocean tends to be a rather long, narrow ocean, somewhat in the form of a, an S. Turning the globe, we come to the Pacific, and as you can see, from your viewpoint, the Pacific almost covers all the area you can see. The third ocean is the Indian Ocean, the area of the monsoons. We have two other oceans. We have the Arctic Ocean, which has a perennial ice cover and so distinguishes itself from the other three. And we have the Antarctic Ocean, and the thing that is peculiar about the Antarctic Ocean is that it extends all the way round the Antarctic continent, and it is the only ocean in which currents can circulate the Earth around Antarctica. Now, to turn to the Mediterranean. The earliest navigators in the Mediterranean were three peoples, the Etruscans, who lived in Italy, the Greeks, who lived in Greece, and the Phoenicians, who lived in the eastern end of the Mediterranean. Now, these people were the great seafarers of the early days, and by and large, they traveled not across the ocean, but they voyaged around its shores, and their sailing instructions were mainly instructions which caused them to follow the winds, and they would stay in a port until they had a favorable wind and then sail to the next port. The uh, part of the oceans which became of interest to them were the tides, and they soon observed that the tides rose and fell twice a day, and observed, in fact, that these tides were uh, rising and falling at the same time as the transit of the moon. Now, the tides in the Mediterranean are not very large, they're only one foot, but it, they did cause tidal currents in some of the passages. When they traveled outside the Mediterranean, the Greeks found that, in fact, in the area around England and in France, that the tides were much higher, maybe as high as 20 to 30 feet. Now, this caused them to wonder. Now, the Greeks, of course, had a well-developed science, and although they had no equipment for measuring the physical processes in the ocean, they were great observers, and they observed that the ocean waters could be evaporated, and that 
the, the water would then uh, fall to the earth again in the form of rain and flow to the, back to the ocean in rivers. And so they gradually built up a, a qualitative knowledge of the oceans uh, by these means. And after, of course, after the Greek civilization and the Roman civilization fell, we entered the Dark Ages, and not very much was learned until about the 12th to 13th century. And then the action shifts to the Bay of Biscay and the area to the west of Europe. And in this area, there is a large continental shelf. Here we have England in the continental shelf, and the fact is the continental shelf there creates large tides. So naturally the navigators of Western Europe became very interested in the tides because the of the difficulties in getting into places like the Thames River, where the tidal currents could be very strong and, of course, as, you pro as you've probably read, in, in the days of sailing ships, they sailed with the tide or entered ports uh, on, on, on the incoming tide. So in the 12th to 13th century, we began to find the first tide tables being produced and tides being predicted. It was possible to predict the tides, of course, because they, as we'll see in a later lecture, they are caused by the transit of the moon and the rotation of the earth. And these are very regular things so that they could predict into the future. The other thing that the navigators of this time learnt was to navigate by the depth of the ocean. Um, and they did this by heaving a line from the ship and with a series of marks on it measuring the depth. So, uh, 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 for example, one passage, say, from Cape Finisterre in Spain to the Bristol Channel. The ship sailed north, just east of north, casting its line until it came to the edge of the continental shelf. When it found the edge of the continental shelf, then it would alter course and steer just west of north until it observed the sandy bottom. Now the way they did this was to put tallow on the end of the line, on, on the weight, which was uh, bring, taking the line to the bottom, and of course they'd pull it up and they'd have a look and see what they got on the bottom. So they would sail north until they found sand, then they would sail a little further north till they found mud, then they would alter course to the west and they would arrive at Bristol. And this was the, the, the method that they used for navigation. Now, there was not a great deal of science of, uh, in, in these days, but late, later science did develop, and at the period in which science developed, we have the great historic voyages across the ocean. The voyage of Columbus, of course, to, to find America, and gradually sea routes developed. Now, with the development of these sea routes and trading around the world, uh, there began to be produced sailing instructions. Now, the sailing ships, of course, had a great deal of difficulty with currents. And to see the difficulty they had, maybe we should first look at a, a picture of the currents as we know them today uh, and s see the problems they had. For example, <coughs> here is a picture, a schematic of the major currents. There is a, a great clockwise gyre in the North Atlantic, an anti-clockwise one in the South Atlantic, an anti-clockwise one in the South Pacific, and so on. Now, a ship going from England to North America would have to pass through the Gulf Stream, which sweeps up the the, the uh, east coast of America. Now the Gulf Stream can reach speeds of three to four knots and uh, these ships weren't very fast. And of course when they got becalmed, if they uh, were in the Gulf Stream, they in fact went backwards. Now <coughs> this uh, was first noticed uh, because it was found that the, that the passage of of the uh, mail ships from England to North America was in fact um, 
two weeks slower than the passage of the merchant ships. And this was brought to the attention of Benjamin Franklin. And if you remember, remember Benjamin Franklin was the head of the post office in the United States. Now, it so happened that Benjamin Franklin knew a Nantucket, Nantucket whaling captain who was in, engaged in the merchant service at that time, and he asked this Nantucket captain why this should be so, why, why the packets, the mail packets, were two weeks slower. And the sea captain told him, well, that's because the skippers of the packets are sailing against this current called the Gulf Stream. And, and he said the, the merchant ships um, knew of the existence of this current because many of them were whaling captains and they knew, they had been whaling and they knew that whales w stayed to the side of this current and so in the, in the course of their whaling they would sail backwards and forwards across it and, and, they, and they knew quite a lot about it. So the, so the, the whaling captains um, would uh, avoid the, the Gulf Stream and the merchant captains and of course their passage from, from, from England to, to uh, North America wa was very much faster. And uh, in the next slide, oops I've gone backwards, <laughs> okay. Now in this next slide we see the, 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 the Gulf Stream as it was sketched out by Benjamin Franklin using um, the knowledge of the sea captains of those days. And he depicts it as a rather broad, broad current sweeping up north and past North America and on to England. And you can possibly see if you look closely, he has pictures of sailing ships in the Gulf Stream. Benjamin Franklin actually had occasion to cross the Gulf Stream several times. He lived in Europe for a period of his life and he observed several of the physical characteristics of it such that it is warmer than the waters on either side of it and in fact he issued sailing instructions for the, the, the sailing ships and advised them to take a thermometer and measure the temperature so that they could uh, get themselves out of the Gulf Stream if they got in it. Of course it was um, to the ship's advantage to sail with the Gulf Stream if they were going from, from America to England. And now, not only this current, but the other currents uh, were charted in those days, mainly through observing the drift of ships, and gradually in the sailing instructions for the ships of those days, we built up a picture of the surface currents, and a considerable amount of time was uh, um, knocked off the, the passage from New York round to San Francisco in the days of, of the gold rush. <coughs> now, following this period that we have talked about, um, the biologists began to become very interested in, in the oceans because the, 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 the fish um, and, and the fish catch uh, is, is um, determined by things like ocean temperatures in part. And in the early days of biology, it was believed, for example, that no biological life existed off the continental shelves and that the abyssal parts of the ocean were in fact dead areas. But they soon began to discover that this in fact was not correct. Uh, a series of voyages uh, off England by the English scientists where they dredged to depths of 600 meters, a little deeper than the continental shelf, began to turn up evidence of marine life at depths greater than 600 meters. The, these early scientists also believed that the oceans were uh, cold at the depths, but it was a uniform four degrees centigrade all over the abyssal parts of the ocean. And in one or two voyages they began to find, in fact, that this was not the case, that there were changes in, in the temperature of the deep ocean from one place to the next. At this time, throughout Europe, there was a considerable interest in, in the oceans, and this culminated in the English fitting out an expedition to circumnavigate the world and to measure all about the oceans, to collect biological life, to plumb the ocean depths, to measure its temperatures, 
to measure its salinities. And this was the famous voyage of the Challenger. Now the Challenger took four years to sail around the ocean. It did it in the late 1800s. And during those four years, it collected all types of life. It must have been one of the best oceanographic expeditions there ever was because everything was new, except it was extremely hard work. And here we have a picture of the Challenger. It was a frigate, a sailing ship, specially outfitted by the Admiralty in conjunction with the Royal Society. And here she is sailing before a storm in the Southern Ocean. You can see the rather large icebergs. It was specially fitted out with a laboratory. This is the laboratory as it looked on an oceanographic ship of those days. And we can see a microscope for examining the flora and the fauna, and various books, reagent bottles for reagents, and uh, two more microscopes. And these were the tools of the trade of those days. To collect the samples <coughs> during this cruise was extremely laborious and very time consuming. They would take them about a whole day to suspend the bottles to collect samples of the water and to measure the temperature and to do their dredging and trawling for biological life. And I have a picture here of the type of trawls used in those days. This isn't the Challenger, it's a later ship called the Michael Sars. But here we see them trawling. This is a long line and from it is flown trawls, which are, are, are like this, uh, just, just a, a little bag uh, of, of net. And they drag these through the water and collect the life at the different depths of the ocean. And this would take them hours and hours and hours to, to do. The results of this expedition, of course, were very far-reaching. They, they did find deep life in all the oceans. They, they measured the ocean depths. They found that the, the waters in the deep oceans in the abyssal parts of the oceans were not four degrees everywhere. In fact, in the southern oceans, they found that they were below freezing, which is possible, of course, because the sea is salt. One of the astounding things which was found was that, uh, that the constituent salts in the ocean were in constant proportion all throughout the oceans. The, the oceans have several salts in them, uh, calcium and magnesium salts, and the ratio of the calcium to the magnesium and to the other constituents were the same. Uh, this was found after a very laborious analysis when the samples of seawater which were collected around the globe were taken back to England. Now you may wonder how do we measure temperature in the ocean when it's maybe as low as zero degrees and the surface water is uh, at the equator, say 20 25 degrees, because if you put the thermometer down there and pull it up, it, it, the thermometer is just going to heat up and, and record the surface temperature. Well, this is done with a rather special thermometer, which has been really the workhorse of physical oceanographers for the last maybe 70 years. And uh, I have one here which you won't be able to see too well, but this thermometer is, this is, the, is constructed, this is the, the mercury here, and the mercury rises through a thin capillary which has a loop in it. And then, this is the recording part of the thermometer. And the thermometer is sent down into the ocean, and then by device I'll show you in a moment, it is, a, it is reversed. Now when it is reversed, the mercury column is broken, and of course this records the temperature at the depth that the, that the, uh, that the thermometer was reversed, and then it is brought to the surface and it can be measured. To collect the <coughs> samples of seawater for the, for the chemical analyses, um, what is used is a special a water bottle, it is called in the jargon, which has two end caps, one at either end, which, which are open when the bottle is sent down. The inside is covered with Teflon to prevent corrosion and contamination. And this is put on a wire over the side of the ship. Let's get it the right way up. 
and then a messenger is slid down the wire and it will strike the top of the bottle. When that happens, I will have to imagine my hands the messenger, these close like this and then the whole device falls off the wire and tips over so it's left hanging on the wire like this. And the thermometers, the thermometers, we have three thermometers, are actually placed inside these racks and when the bottle falls over the thermometer is reversed. So at each depth we have a sample of the water and we have a record of the temperature. And the water is brought on deck and, and, and the bottle is drained through this little spigot here and the um, salinity is determined and uh, the chemists uh, look at things such as oxygen and other chemical constituents of the water such as nutrients. Now, <coughs> we have a slide of the, of the messenger and I'm sorry, of, of the wire. And this is a picture taken in the Arctic. And here you see the, the wire which the bottle is put on. And then the messenger slides down and trips the bottle. Then below each bottle there is another messenger which is released and it goes down and trips the next bottle. So when an oceanographic ship is taking these measurements, it has about two miles of wire out because the oceans are that deep. And uh, maybe about 20 of these bottles with their thermometers. And then the messenger is, when, when, the, when the cast is set, as we say, the messenger is placed on the wire, it trips the first bottle, and we have one of these domino effects, another messenger is released, it traps the next bottle, and so on, down to the bottom, and then it is brought up. But it's very time consuming to do a station in the deep ocean, uh, which is uh, m maybe two miles or more deep, it takes possibly four to six hours, depending on the expertise, and sometimes it goes wrong and the whole thing has to be repeated again. And as you can see from this slide, there are sometimes problems in the, in the Arctic with ice. The, 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 um, uh, one has to put the wire down through the ice. But this has been the, the workhorse of the oceanographer for the last 50 years. And with it, he has charted the temperatures and salinity of the ocean. And from these, he has deduced the, the currents and the temperatures of the ocean. Now, here we have a chart of the, of the temperatures in the North Atlantic at 100 meters depth. And near the equator, of course, the, it is quite warm. The, 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 the temperature is around 20 degrees Celsius. You can see an extension of this warm water towards the north, which is the, a, a manifestation of the Gulf Stream, the western boundary current, the Gulf Stream. In the northern areas, you can notice that the temperature, in fact, is less than zero degrees in the Arctic area. And this, there is a, actually quite a sharp boundary here which doesn't appear on this chart. And this is called the polar front. And it is the boundary between the cold waters and the warm waters and is bounded by the Gulf Stream. Now, we will discuss this a little more at length when we come to discuss the, the ocean circulation in the, in the next lecture. Now, the, since the, the thermometer, of course, there, there has been many advances in, in, ocean, in, in the instrumentation used for physical oceanography, we can no longer just deduce the currents from charts of temperature and salinity we have current meters which can be replaced in the ocean on moored buoy systems and which can be left there for periods of up to a year. And these give a record of the, of the currents. Um, instead of measuring salinity by taking a sample of the water and bringing it from the surface, up, up to the surface, and, and then putting it in bottles and measuring the salinity, there are, in fact, um, automatic devices which can be lowered into the ocean and record the salinity in situ. And, and these are uh, electronic, and the signal is, is brought up on, on a wire, and, and the, the salinity is recorded on, on the ship. 
This, of course, has been a quite an advance in oceanography because it now gives us a continuous record of salinity from the surface to the bottom. There have been other devices which uh, free floating objects uh, which can be placed in the ocean and tracked. If, uh, the advent of the satellite has, has led to the possibility of tracking drogues which will hopefully follow the surface currents. There are also devices which can be placed in the ocean at a specific depth and then these devices move with the currents at that depth and they are tracked by using acoustics. This has been one of the more exciting uh, uh, developments in oceanography because it has been found that the deep currents uh, do things we didn't think that they did. And again, with the satellites, when it comes to the surface temperatures, uh, the, the satellite can measure surface temperatures using infrared radiation from the surface. Uh, this isn't as accurate as the oceanographer would like at the present time, but it, it doesn't require a ship and the laborious uh, procedure of going to and fro in the ocean on ships and will give a continuous coverage of the, of the surface temperatures. Of course, the problem is that, that when there is a cloud in the ocean, uh, we can't see the surface. But uh, with, with the satellites, which uh, is planned for the future, they, they may, will make several passes over the same area in, in a period of one to two days. Uh, I'm sorry, maybe about 10 days. And uh, maybe they'll miss once, but they will get it the next time. And the satellite, of course, is also an excellent platform for observing the, the movement of sea ice. Now, in the next lecture, we will deal with the ocean circulation and with the major currents in the ocean. And we're going to discover some amazing things ab ab about these currents. And I will describe the forces which generate them and uh, the abyssal circulation and the surface circulation of the ocean.